Greetings from Crossroads Church in Aransas Pass, Texas. You know, as humans, we have breath, life, willpower, emotions, good days, bad days, strengths, and yes, sometimes weaknesses. But no matter where you are in life, the highs and lows, or how much progress is being made, we encourage you to take some time with us in watching this next video. Take care. Amen. And so today is uh, around the world Christians will observe this as uh, Palm Sunday, which is the first day of the last week of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And we're so thankful it's, it's considered a, a holy week. And it starts on, uh, as I mentioned, Palm Sunday when Jesus rode in the city of Jerusalem on a colt and the crowds were worshiping him and throwing their palm branches down. Now, I'm not like the Lord. So I don't expect you to throw your palm branches down. But when I come to the church, you should throw your coats down. Uh, and so I can walk on your coats instead of the floor. Okay, well, it was just a suggestion. I see that's not going over very well. But on that Friday, or that Sunday, rather, Jesus, he rode into the city. And, and even the children were leading the procession. And they were crying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, which that term literally means Lord, save us. And I'm thankful that he did. And thankful that he did save us. What a, what a wonderful time of the year to celebrate the fact that he died. Your sins were so bad. Your sins were so bad. I'm talking about your sins. Your sins were so bad, Jesus had to come and die for you. And I'm thankful that my sins, which are probably worse, I'm thankful he came and died for all of us. Once, once and for all, he was a sacrifice for sins. So uh, here's what the Quran says about Jesus. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. Muhammad is mentioned four times in the Quran. Jesus is mentioned over 20 times. I think 25 times that Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. So they do try to bring honor to him as a prophet. But here's what the Quran says about Jesus. And for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Quran continues with this, and they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except of the following assumption, and they did not kill him for certain. Quran got it a little bit wrong. <laughs> I'm thankful that Jesus died for our sins and on the third day, which we'll celebrate next Sunday, on the third day, he was raised from the dead, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. I don't know how you spend your weekends, but the last weekend of his life, on a Friday, Jesus was crucified. On a Saturday, he stormed the gates of hell, and on a Sunday, he was raised from the dead. That's a pretty eventful weekend right there. Give him praise one more time. Would you do it? So we are, we are so thankful for our, our, is he your Lord this morning? Is he your Savior? Oh, man, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you, if you, uh, switching gears here, if you want to change somebody's life, invite them to church. Invite somebody to church this week. We're gonna, I'm going to be on a crusade to try to get you to invite someone to church. When people come to church, 86% 86% of the time when people come to church, they don't come because of the pastor or the praise team. They come because a friend invited them. So it's really not on me. It's on you guys. So you need to knock it off and get busy about the Lord's work here. Can I get a good amen? amen. Invite somebody to church. Grab them. Take them hostage. No, don't do that. Don't put them in handcuffs and drag them to church. Just in, invite people to church. And uh, I'll tell you what, Jesus can change a life. Amen? So we're going to conclude the series uh, this morning called Life Without Limitations. and. And I, I want to talk about such a very important topic. Last week, we talked about fear and how that that limitation really is one of the main reasons why we don't experience the very best that God has for us, because we allow that spirit of fear to keep us from being bold and courageous. I believe God's called us to be courageous, not fearful, not intimidated, but to be courageous and to be bold. Not because we have all this confidence in ourselves. My confidence this morning is not in myself. My confidence is in Him. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are 
safe. And I'm thankful for that name. It's that name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's that name. It's, there's no other name given unto heaven whereby men must be saved but the name of Jesus. The name Jesus literally means deliverer or savior. And I'm thankful that he bears that name. But not only he bears that name, but he saved me and he saved you this morning. And I'm thankful. You know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you cannot lose for winning. You can't. You say, well, what if I get sick and die? Well, going to be with Jesus is not bad. I don't want to be on the next bus load, but you know what? I mean, when it's my time, I'm ready to go. I'm ready. You know, I've had enough of this town. I've had enough. I'm listening, people. I've had enough of Aransas Pass. But if I want to feel better about my life and where I live, I go to Ingleside and drive through that godforsaken town. Uncircumcised Philistines over there. <laughs> I love Ingleside. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm like Abraham, who's looking for a city, city whose builder and maker is God. There's another city I'm looking forward to. It's not, it's not a coastal city of Texas. Man, aren't you glad you live in Texas and not California? Lord, have mercy. I don't know what horrible sin those people committed that God made them live in California, but I'm glad that we live in Texas, and that's the reason why the Bible says don't mess with Texas. So, talk about life without limitations. So, so we have many people experience that spirit of fear, and so they're afraid to break through. They're afraid to step out in confidence and faith believing, to, to break through limitations and problems and those things that would ensnare us, enslave us, and keep us in a cycle of defeat and dysfunction and affliction and addiction and you know, depressed mindset and anxiety and that spirit of fear. But I want to talk about another tremendous limitation that you and I can really experience in our life that just can be devastating to us as followers of Jesus. But first of all, I want to read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I've been reading it out of a different version every Sunday morning for the most part. So today I want to read out of the NIV. What does the NIV stand for? You're wrong. New International Version. The NIV, and here's what it says in the NIV. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. He's able to do immeasurably more. We read NLT last Sunday morning and it said infinitely more. The uh, ESV, which is one of my favorites, says abundantly more. So you're kind of getting the picture that whatever you can ask, whatever you can ask or think of God, he's able to do infinitely or immeasurably more. The reason why we don't experience that, we don't step into that destiny, we don't step into that plan is because we have limitations in our life that we haven't figured out how to break through. Understand that in our series, we are dealing with the understanding that, first of all, God has a plan. Here are several things that I struggle with about the plan of God. Number one, God never explains to me his plan. First of all, I know he has a plan. Second of all, he never explains to me his plan. So third of all, that makes me doubt, number one, that he has a plan because he doesn't explain it to us. All we can do as a follower of Jesus is step in to take the next step. God doesn't generally lay out 20 or 30 steps for you. He wants you to take the next step. And that's what living in that courage and that boldness is all about, that you step with confidence and with boldness into the next step, look, you'll find all kinds of reasons why you can't, why I can't do this, why I shouldn't do this, why I should not try to do this. You can reason yourself and talk yourself out of experiencing the very best that God has for you. There, there are in, in the body of Christ, there's so many people that sit on church pews that God really wants, has so much more for them, wants them to step into a ministry and a calling, not necessarily public speaking, not necessarily singing, if you sing and you sounded like a wounded moose, God is not calling you to the praise team. I don't care how inspired you feel. But I'm just simply saying that your calling in your ministry may be something else, and you need to find that calling in that ministry. Uh, I, w- I was listening to a guy one time, and he has a, I mean, a massive church. And he said there was a, there was a lady in the, in, the, in, in the beginning of the church, that, and he just used her as an example, that... Uh, God kind of dealt with her about trying to do something to help welcome the visitors that would come. And so what she did is every Saturday she would bake cookies 
And she would have a package ready. That was her ministry. That was her calling. And whenever there were visitors there, she gave them cookies. And that was part of the church welcoming new families in the body of Christ. If you make cookies, please keep them away from me. Carbs are the devil. Did you know that? Carbs are the devil. They're straight from Lucifer. So lead us not to temptation. But visitors, we can give them to the visitors. Just don't give them to the pastor. Something about that didn't sound right as I was saying it, but, well, I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks are not affected by carbs like me and some of the rest of the folks are, so uh, if you can eat cookies, knock yourself out. But listen, God does have a great plan, but to understand the plan, or to get to the plan, you have to understand that there's a process that he uses, and it's not always pleasant. Some of the most difficult transitions that you and I, some of the most Difficult problems and trials that you and I face are literally God allows them. Sometimes God sends them. God allows them because he wants to take us from where we are to where he wants us to be. Sometimes he has, has to ruffle. Uh, he has to ruffle our feathers because we all tend to want to fit into stay in a comfort zone, especially when you start getting my age. You know, I got way more years behind me than I do in front of me. And it would be very easy for me just to put it on cruise control and to say, you know what, I'm not a young guy anymore. My hair doesn't fall out. I'm, I about lost half my mind. You know, I don't know what's going on in the world anymore. If I lose any more, my mind get more senile. They'll make me president of the United States or something, I guess. I don't know. Okay, that was uncalled for. I shouldn't have said that. But here's the deal. I, listen, as I get older, I find myself not, not wanting to just put it on cruise control. I, yeah, I just want to be more passionate about what God's called me to do. I want to make a difference before I leave this world. And too many more jokes like that, it may be happening soon. Because I know a lot of you voted for Biden and you're just really upsetting me right now. So you just need to calm yourself down. You have to realize that you have to forgive. You have to forgive me if you want to go to heaven. Can I get a good amen there? Wow. Wow. I've just lost you folks, haven't I? So if you, in case you're thinking that I'm making this up, here's what a prophet, Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah, a very popular portion of Scripture says, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, I know the plans... I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's what God is speaking over your life today, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Even those things that we encounter that are difficult, even those things that sometimes will shake us to the core and rock our world, those things like that that, that are not comfortable to go through, those things many times are sent by God it's because it's part of the plan. And and we have to trust his plan, we have to trust his process, and we have to trust that he has a purpose for our life. When Jeremiah prophesied this, just to give you a little backdrop, historical backdrop, he prophesied prophesied this to a tiny nation by the name of Judah. You remember David's kingdom had been divided between his son and uh, another one that was really chosen more by God, but then both of them went off the rails, got off the reservation. So the northern kingdom was Israel, the southern kingdom was Judah. And there was, I think there's only a couple of tribes. So, so Judah was a very tiny nation. But uh, Jeremiah was a prophet to that nation, and he prophesied to that tiny nation. And they were surrounded by superpowers like Egypt and the Assyrians and the Babylonians. But uh, throughout his ministry, uh, I think around 40 years, Jeremiah preached and prophesied. People totally rejected him, totally rejected the warnings. But Jeremiah was trying to prepare them, trying to warn them about a coming invasion from the Babylonians, who was one of those super powers. The disaster was not God's plan. Disaster for our life was, is not God's plan. But the conquest was not the process, and defeat and exile was really not God's purpose. But yet those things, because they rejected the word of the Lord, because those people in Judah refused to obey God, and they began to get into idol worship. And I'm not talking about just dabbling a little bit, a little bit here and there. The, the Jewish people had, their relationship with God had deteriorated. Their, their life had deteriorated to the point that they're worshiping other gods, even to gods, foreign gods, that they would sacrifice their own children to. That's how fall, far they had fallen. And so God needed to get their attention. So this disaster was not really God's plan, but he had to allow it. Listen, God wants to uh, do amazing work in us and through us, but we limit God and we never really experience that abundant life because of these limitations. And so the, the limitation I want to talk to you today or the challenge that we have 
living in this old world in the year 2024 is, is how as a follower of Jesus can I maintain my integrity? You see, that which will derail us or will do, detour us rather from the plan of God is a loss of integrity in some area of our life or disobedience. One of the most important factors in the design of a ship or a boat is to ensure the water in which the vessel floats does not enter the hull and cause progressive flooding. So when you make a boat, when you make a ship, you want to make sure that it's made to the place that it does not allow water to enter the hull and cause progressive flooding. This is called watertight integrity. And if a boat or a ship does not have watertight integrity, what happens to it? It sinks. And likewise, in our own lives, if we find some area of our life where we don't have integrity, what's going to happen to our life? It's going to sink. In fact, the Apostle Paul used, used the, the analogy of, he said, I want to make sure when I preach to others that I live, I try to live the life because I don't want to become shipwrecked. And that's what happens to many folks. You can be, listen, you can be a follower of Jesus. You can ask Jesus in your heart. You can pray the sinner's prayer. But the wages of sin is still death. You say, well, wait a second. Jesus forgives me of my sins. Yes, he absolutely does. I'm thankful for for that forgiveness and the fact we recognize and celebrate and we rejoice because he died on the cross for us. But understand that he does forgive us and God's grace covers us. But that grace is not given to us as an occasion to the flesh. And so whatever I reap in my life, that is what I'm going to sow. So if that ship does not maintain its watertight integrity, it sinks. And so also in our lives, if we compromise, we're going to be sunk. Our lives are going to end up being shipwrecked. So I want to talk for a few moments about about integrity. Now, Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He talks about don't lose your integrity. He said, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know what God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So Paul said, don't be conformed. Don't copy the lifestyle and the behavior of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or let God change the way that you think. So uh, earlier this year, I, uh, I had the flu, and it wasn't a horrible, I wasn't horribly sick or anything, but obviously just staying away from everybody, I didn't want to share the, the good times, and, and so I remember, uh, so uh, I just kind of laid around a lot, took the meds, and you know, and some of the meds will make you sleepy, and so <clears throat> I know there was, a, there was a day or two that I just flipped on the TV or whatever, and I just laid on the couch, kind of dozed in and out, and, and uh, I I. I Stumbled on one of those channels that was just showing episode after episode of Dateline. How many of you? How many of you like Dateline? You like to watch Dateline? Okay, so so here's here's one of the things I learned about Dateline. Okay, I know that there's there has been racial problems in our country today, but here's what I here's what I learned about Dateline. If you are murdered, chances are overwhelming you'll be murdered by a person of the same race. Do you know that? And from watching Dateline, I found out that chances are it's your spouse that murdered you. So that, I learned two things. Number one, I don't want to get married. That increases my chances of not being murdered. I don't want to get married. And if I do, I don't want to marry a white woman, because that really increases it. So I learned, I learned that. But here's, here's something else that, that I, found, I found so troubling. So a lot of it, and I know that they... Uh, statistically, they always look at the person closest to the victim or whatever. And, and I know specifically they probably highlight certain types of homicides or whatever that have to do with missing, missing people. And, they, and whenever there's a missing person, they, they, look at, uh, they look at the spouse. And inevitably, when a spouse goes missing, they look and they look at the spouse, uh, that's the person that's closest to them, and oftentimes they find that that person has started an affair. And I can't tell you how disturbing it was 
that there would be two individuals, there would be major players in that episode of Dateline that started the affair, and they met, the, they met each other at church, and they were in the choir together, or they served together, and they started getting a little bit friendly, and next thing you know, things kind of progressed, and next thing you know, the guy's working his charm and his magic. My wife's not paying attention to me, and she's paying attention to me. And then he decides, well, I really want this woman. I don't want to be with my wife anymore. And here's what they say. Here's what they say. Divorce is too much of a scandal because I'm a Christian, so I'm just going to murder her and be with my girlfriend. I cannot tell you how many times I saw that. There was one, there was one episode where I won't call the person's name because this person absolutely nothing to do with the violent act, but it was a worldwide known TV person, a preacher, and, and the person's really legit as far as I know. I've never heard anything bad about this person. They have a worldwide ministry, and they had, uh, this person had a man that was charged of their security for their ministry, and one day his wife, not only his wife, but his kids were murdered. And after an investigation, they found out, they realized that this guy, who was head of security for one of the greatest worldwide ministries that originates here in America, but it's worldwide, this guy wanted to be with his girlfriend, so he not only murdered his wife, but he murdered his kids. And he was a Christian. I'm going to tell you, guys, we got, we got to do better, you know. As, as followers of Jesus, now I realize that the vast majority of Christians would never even go that far or take it that far. But we need to realize that God has called us to integrity in the church. Now, look, I, I just want to say, all have sinned. And when I, when I mean all, you've sinned, I've sinned, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the purpose of this message is when you make a mistake, when I make a mistake, the purpose is not to beat each other up and to be judgmental and to be hateful and to act like there's no forgiveness because there is always forgiveness when we ask for that forgiveness. So that's not, that's not the purpose of this message, not to beat you down. If you stumbled and, and you have fallen, nobody needs to go around and kick you while you're down. We want to try to encourage each other. We want to try to bless each other. We want to try to extend grace. I'm just, I mean, the point of this message is, is for us to understand uh, to be challenged to do better and to live in every single area of your life with integrity in your relationships, in your marriage, in your business, in your finances, in your relationships with other people, that you tell the truth, that you represent, uh, the, you know, the, the cause of Christ and the person of Christ in a way that we do not dishonor him. So don't lose your integrity. Oh, everybody's, well, everybody's doing it. And, and you know, I, I saw one the other day where there was, again, I won't mention names, but there was an accusation. It was a pretty severe accusation made against a person who's very well known as a preacher on TV. And I don't know, I don't know. I mean, anybody can throw, anybody can level any accusation about anybody at any time. So I don't necessarily put a lot of stock in that. So it wasn't, the, it wasn't the accusation that concerned me, but it was the way that this individual responded by simply saying, well, even if I had did it, all I have to do is ask for forgiveness. Well, no, if you're, if you're a pastor and you have done something like that, you don't ask for forgiveness. You have to step back for a while and you have to repent and you have to submit yourself to authority and you have to make restitution. You have to do the right thing. But the problem is a lot of times with people, especially that are very visible, they think the rules don't apply to them. And listen, I don't care how long you've lived for Jesus. I don't care what you've accomplished or what I've accomplished. The rules do apply to us. And we have to live with integrity because if we don't, that will tremendously limit us on how we can find the plan and go through that process and experience the purpose that God has for us. So not only do we not want to lose our integrity, but we really have to guard our integrity. Psalms 119 verse 9 says this, How can a young man... Keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word. How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? I saw an article the other day as a college professor. He'd been doing some research on pastors that had experienced moral failure. 
And unfortunately, this is a very prevalent thing, whether you're talking about the Protestant church, the Catholic church, the Christian church. Listen, guys, we, got, we have to do better. And this, this was uh, just a long article, and it was uh, some of the factors that led up to a pastor. But I, but I don't want to get into the whole article, but I just there was one point that I thought was interesting that really would apply to all of us. And when this college professor did research on ministers that fall into moral failure, one of the first things that those pastors mentioned that they quit doing is they quit reading the Bible and they quit praying. And you say, well, pastors have to come up with sermons. Well, I can tell you it's a different thing to try and you know, work up a sermon and prepare a sermon or a lesson. That's a different thing than actually getting into God's Word and allowing God's Word to speak to you. I'm telling you something, man. The, if you read the Bible... You'll quit sinning. But if you keep sinning, you'll quit reading the Bible. Because here's the thing. In America today, most Christians want a Jesus that reflects their preferences about life. Most American Christians want a church that is molded in their image. Well, my opinion of church is, my opinion is this, and there's my preference. And look, we all have opinions, we all have preferences, we... All those things. And I'm not saying they're not significant. They're not important. But we, we need to understand that when Jesus died on that cross, he didn't die on the cross just to be our Savior. We love the whole thing about a Savior. I don't know about you. I need a Savior. You and I need a Savior. We need to be saved from our sins. But he also died to be our Lord. Well, that's a whole, but that's taking it to a whole different level. It's like you guys, you married that woman. So you said, I do. But then when you start obeying her, that's what really what marriage is all about. You obey her. Ladies, can I get a good amen? You obey her. So we come to faith in Christ, and he becomes our Savior. But we need to take it to the next level. We need to allow him to be the Lord of our life, that we serve him to please him. And we live in a way. And, and one of the most important ways to ensure that you don't walk in compromise, that you don't allow yourself to lose your integrity is by taking daily time just to spend time. I'm not talking about you're trying to write a college thesis. I'm not talking about you're trying to go back and read out of the original biblical language. I'm just sim simply saying if you'll just take some time every day to read through God's word and let God's word speak to you. One of the pastors I like to listen to, a uh, huge church, he has a church like about 30,000 I have a church of 30, so we're pretty close, you know, just a just few zeros off. But he was talking about, uh, he was talking about one time how he came, a, a, he had a uh, military officer came to him. He, was, he just retired. He was like a major or colonel or something like that. And he came to the pastor, he was a, he's a brand new Christian, and he told the pastor, he said, look, he said, I don't, you know, I'm new to this Jesus thing. He said, but I'm telling you, he said, I am struggling horrifically with pornography. He said, and I hate it. He said, because I know what effect it's having on me. It's not this innocent little, you know, deal where, uh, you know, hobby or habit that people have. It's not, it's not innocent. It can be very destructive. It devalues women, can create a spirit of lust. You'll do things and think things and act on things if you allow that, if you allow that to stay in your heart and your mind. But he said, I'm trying to get that out of my life, and I don't know how to do it. I try. And he said, I am, I am an officer. I am a retired military officer. My life. It's characterized by discipline. I can't discipline this thing out of my life. And the pastor said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Try this and see what, see what happens. He said, for the next two weeks, I want you to read the Bible 30 minutes every day. Just read the Bible 30 minutes every day. See if it helps. I don't know if the pastor was indicating in that message that that was like a divine thought from God or if he was just saying, hey, let's try. Let's see if this thing actually, let's see if it actually works. Two weeks later, a couple of Sundays later, that military officer came to him, retired military officer came to him and said, Pastor, he said, I am telling you, this is unbelievable. I started reading the Bible and my life started to change. And he said, that which had such a tremendous hold on me, he said, it doesn't have a hold on, it, hold on me anymore. I have been set free. Because here's the thing about the Bible. You can read it for it to inform you or you can read it and allow it to transform you. And God's word God's word will give you the ability then 
to live with integrity and not fall into weakness and temptation that will keep you, a tremendous limitation will keep you from experiencing the very best that God has for you. So here's my third and last point. Can I get a good amen on point number three? Woo! Oh, you guys have been so attentive. I mean, I don't know how y'all do it. Sleep with your eyes open, but hey, good job. They say, well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. You mess up. I mess up. We all mess up. Doesn't matter how much we love Jesus. There's, there, you know, there are things sometimes present itself in our lives. But you can, if you've lost your integrity, if you have not been guarding your integrity, you can reclaim your integrity. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The bad news is that we all get off track from time to time. You know, and, and Solomon even wrote in the Proverbs, he said, a righteous man, he said a righteous man, he didn't say an unrighteous man, he said an unrighteous he said, a righteous man will fall seven times, but he gets back up. Here's the deal. When you fall, just don't stay down. Get up. Admit it. You know, quit it. Forget it. You know what I'm saying? You admit what you did, confess it, then forget about it. And just keep working. Keep working to reclaim God's integrity in your life in that particular area. So we get off a of track. The good news is we can find forgiveness and restoration. Because all of us want to experience, I believe all of us here this morning want to experience the very best, the very best that God has for us. But we are limited sometimes because God is limited by the fact that there's some area of our life that we are lacking integrity. And so allow the Holy Spirit through spending time in God's Word, through talking to Him, through yielding and humbling yourself before him, allow the Holy Spirit to begin to reveal things to you because there may be some changes that need to take place. And a lot of times people don't, people don't like that when the Holy Spirit, listen guys, the Holy Spirit's going to be all up in your business. He's going to be all up in your business. He's going to be working. He's going to be pointing things out. He doesn't do this to condemn us, but he does this. That's the first step into getting us to realize that area of our life that we, we hide in the darkness. We keep it in the shadows. Jesus said, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. So we want to keep it in the darkness. We think it's hidden. We think it's a secret sin. But nobody knows about it. And I'm just telling you something, that your secret sin at some point will find its way into your public life. And that those things which are hidden one day will be revealed. So the best thing you and I can do is ask for forgiveness. Confess that sin. And, and John said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Aren't you thankful for his forgiveness today? You and I are not perfect. We're forgiven. And I'm thankful we can reclaim that integrity and have integrity in every area of our life so that we can live a life without limitations, allowing the enemy to defeat us in so many ways. Stand with me this morning and let's pray. And we'll, we will be dismissed. If you have a special need, just lift your hand towards heaven and let's, let's believe God this morning. Father, we just thank you, Lord, because you do hear and answer prayer. We're thankful, Lord, that your promises are yes and amen to those that believe. Your word says that if we want to please you, we must believe that you are and that you uh, diligently reward those that seek you. So today, Father, we recognize in faith believing that you're our source, that you will meet our needs according to your riches and glory. And every family, every individual uh, uh, here today that has a special need, I ask, Lord, that you would meet that need. I pray for restoration. I pray for healing. I pray for strength. I pray for peace, direction, and guidance in each life. And I pray, Father, that those that are not able to be here because of illness or some other situations going on in their life. We pray that you'd be real to them, minister to them, strengthen them, give them wisdom, direction, and guidance. And Lord, I pray for each one of us here today. Lord, we all struggle with issues of integrity from time to time. We struggle with inconsistency with what our life should be and what it actually is from time to time. But I'm thankful, Lord, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just, forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I pray, Lord, that we'd have a passion to live before you, with integrity, that we would live a life that would be pleasing to you. Father, that our lives would reflect the righteousness and the holiness of the God that we serve. And Jesus died on the cross, not so that we could live in our sins, but we could be free from our sins. 
And these things, Lord, these areas of disobedience which, which limit your ability to work in our lives because we're not a pure vessel. Help us to do better and help us, Lord, to get our eyes upon you and to live in a way that pleases you. Not to be conformed to this world or copy the behavior of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind or allow you to change our lives by the way we think. Father, go with us as we leave this place. Help each one of us to invite somebody to church this next week. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. But you can't, 20 seconds, you can't leave for 20 seconds.